little more, a little closer to that bubble. Uh, this is a little in the beginning, but I did want to ask you to start. Yes. You were a successful football player and an actor. It's, oh, Raiders, that's Raiders. right. I can't Woo! believe we got a go Raiders in Colorado. Bronco, that's in Bronco <laughs> territory, go <laughs> Raiders, yeah. Okay. How does one do both of those things? Normally someone wants to do football, someone wants to be an actor, you got to do both. Yeah, I, I, um, I do both, you just do them. You know, you don't think about it, you just do them. You're very fortunate, I guess, to get an opportunity uh, to do it professionally, which I did, and that you can somehow convince people that you have what it takes to do it, and that your body holds up for a minute, that you actually get it done, and then uh, you, whatever transition there is to make, that you make the transition, and that that works out well, and uh, like a cat with nine lives, you just keep going. You know, every time I got knocked down, I just get up and try to go back and do it again. I read a very interesting story about how you were cast as Apollo Creed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, your story probably is far more interesting than, than what actually happened. Um, try to be brief, because these stories tend to go on forever, because they take a long time to actually happen. But uh, as much of uh, so-called Hollywood, you know, film business, whether it's independent or movie films, uh, theater, um, uh, studio films happen, uh, there's a casting sort of session that goes on and people try to find the right person for a role, unless you're number one or number two on the call list, which basically means they want you for that movie as opposed to somebody else, right? So, uh, Paul Green wasn't number one or number two on the call sheet, and they were searching for this person to fill that role, who would be a boxer, and uh, who was good enough as an actor to carry it off. And since I hadn't boxed, uh, I had to convince them that I was good enough, and so of course, like any good actor, what do actors do when they stand in front of the camera and get on stage? They lie. They pretend to be something they aren't. So I lied. I told them I was a boxer. And uh, then I gave them some story of, uh, you know, well, you know, when I was in Canada playing ball for the BC Lions, the off season, I'd go and I'd be a club boxer and blah blah blah. Whether they bought it or not, I don't know. But eventually, I got a chance to. Uh, Go into the ring, John Alice, the director, took Sly and I in and actually took me in at first to make sure I could move around the ring, I guess, with a couple of professionals and they thought I was good enough. Took me back and, uh, you know, as the story goes, the rest is history. Nobody else was good enough. It was only me. It was only me supposed to play Apollo Creed. Nobody could have ever done that role as well as I and here I stand today. We'll see. When I watched the Rocky movies, up until even Action Jackson, on screen, physically, you are a very intimidating presence. I'm intimidating even in person, what are you talking about? <laughs> Come on. I wanted to ask you what goes into the Carl Weathers training regimen when you have to get ready for these films. Well, I start by eating 15 bowls of Cheerios in the morning. And uh, I like, you know, whole milk because I want fat. And then I uh, do a couple of malteds, so I like a lot of sugar. And then I have a couple of scotches that I throw down. And then, after that. and then I go sit on the couch for about three or four hours and watch cartoons. And then you, got, you know what I'm saying. And then I go outside and I go to the nearest high school and I watch kids run around there. And when they're tired, I say, okay, that was a good workout. <laughs> And then I, you know, I go back home and I take a nap, you know, three or four hours. And when I wake up, I go find something that's really fattening to eat. You know, maybe a pound of bacon, 20, 30 eggs, big loaf of bread, white bread, of course. I don't want anything that's high, you know, really good for you. I don't want junk. And uh, then finally, I can finish it off with some gummy bears. I go to sleep at night, I get up in the morning and repeat. That's the Carl Weathers training regimen. And you know, that and a little makeup and bam! You know? I know you guys are gonna- Look at that, that guy in stammering, he doesn't even know how to deal with that. 
I know you guys are going to have questions about Predator. I want to ask, I watched Action Jackson this week. It was one of my favorite movies as a kid. I love it now. Is that where you decided, you know what? I can do comedy too, and I can do comedy almost as well, or maybe maybe even better, some would argue, than, than you do action. You're, you're, you're very good timing, sir. Well, you know, I, I said this to someone earlier. It really all depends on lighting. You know, a lot of people don't really, really get it. But, you know, if something isn't written well, it's kind of hard to pull it off. And when things are written well, you have a much better chance of succeeding. So you have to give a lot of props to writers. And then as actors, we always think we know more than the people who are directing us. You then have to tell the writer that he's not funny enough to throw in your own lines, right? And usually your lines aren't nearly as funny as the writer's. So you back off eventually and do what they gave you to or what that was written in the first place. Uh, and so if you have success and audiences actually like it, and very often there's no way of knowing what audiences are going to really like. You would like to think you know. But until it's all edited, score is put there, color corrected, and all that stuff, it's cut really well, it's put in the movie theater, you get a bunch of people sitting in there, and they're all laughing at the same time. Now you can say, oh, I'm really funny. <laughs> you know? But you don't know before that. So it goes back to writing. Until there was good writing and gave me good lines, and I worked with really good people, uh, I never thought I was that funny. And actually, the truth is, I still don't. I've just been very, very fortunate. How do you get the part of Chubbs in Happy Gilmore? Uh, well, that part in particular was not due to anything I did other than going in and meeting with Adam. But the reason I got that job was because of the great Bernie Brostein. And most of you probably don't know that name, but Bernie Brostein was a manager who managed a lot of the great, great, great comedy talent, including Adam back in the day. He managed people like uh, Aykroyd and Belushi, and he was very much responsible for Saturday Night Live, being on the air, uh, along with all the other people there, of course. And uh, Bernie, at the time, uh, was the president of Lorimar Pictures. I was under contract. That's how Action Jackson got made, because Bernie you know, said, OK, I want to do this movie. And uh, Bernie called me one day and uh, told me about you know this movie uh, Happy Gilmore and said uh, you should go meet Adam. And I went, I met Adam, and we had a, maybe we sat for about a half hour and talked. And next thing you know, uh, I was doing that movie. So it's all all Bernie and Adam ultimately who had to you know say yes, give it a blessing. But uh, I owe everything to Bernie. I owe so much more to Bernie than just that. He was, uh, he was quite a remarkable guy. What's it like on the set of an Adam Sandler film for you? Well, I can tell you what it was like on that set. <laughs> it was crazy. It was fun, it was funny. Uh, wonderful thing about really talented people, and Adam is one of them. Uh, you know, a script basically is a blueprint. It's like uh, you build a house, right? Things are always gonna change a little bit. Just based on whatever is necessary at the time, you make changes as you go along. Uh, certain things don't turn out the way you wanted them or you thought they were going to turn out. And uh, with Adam, it's like you get on set, and regardless of what's on the page, some things come out of people's mouths that are much funnier than was written on the paper when you start talking to each other. And so he would do five, six, seven takes of the same, same basic setup, but with different words. And, and it really is a kind of a free process, particularly in comedy. You know, when you're doing drama, it's a little more structured. But in comedy, you can really riff off of each other. And, and since he had so many comedic talents in that movie, I mean, it's just people who were really funny. I didn't have to do much but stand there and be pretty much the straight guy and put on the stupid hand. And, <laughs> and you know, and talk about the alligator and bit my hand off and go through the window backwards. And, you know, all that kind of crazy stuff. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was an awful lot of fun. All in the hips. Is that all you? Hey, man, that was all me. All in the hips. <laughs> just tap it in. Tap, tap, tap it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about it is, what makes it funny is not just the line. If you really watch the movie, and people have, sometimes you see things, but you don't really see what's happening. 
So the, the all in the hips, when we came to doing that scene, you know, and you rehearse it when you finally get there, and I, you don't really know what you're going to do, but we get there, and Adam's there, and he's supposed to be doing the putt, right? And he's not doing it right, and so I go up to him, and I'm supposed to show him how to putt, right? Well, any of us who've ever seen anybody do that, especially when you have a man and a woman, the guy goes up, right? And he puts his arms around him, right? and he's showing her how to putt. So when I go up and put my hands around Adam, and I'm like, right up on him. Solid <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of did it with a lisp. You know? It's all in the hips. All and Adam just couldn't hold himself. So he really watched you. He's trying to get out, get out. <laughs> so that's what makes it funny, you know, when you when you can riff with each other and do that kind of stuff. Then it gets really funny because you see these people are out of their minds. You know? <laughs> So that that's you know all through the movie that we had we had fun stuff. I think that movie as a result um, just is so much funnier than it probably was in the page because of just the people. Did you have a similar experience when you did Arrested Development? Because technically you play yourself. Not technically, actually, yeah. I play <laughs> except I played a, a version of myself that doesn't really exist. Right. You know, I mean, the whole idea there was that, well, little, little kind of Hollywood story. So I get a call, I think it was from my agent at the time, and um, I get a call from my agent saying, you know, they want you to do uh, Arrested Development. And I'd seen the show, and okay, so what, what's, you know, what's the role, what's the character? And um, originally what I was told, well, I didn't want to do it. That's the first thing. And the only reason I didn't want to do it was I just wasn't interested in doing more one-offs on television, guesting on a television show. If I wasn't going to be a regular on a television show, why do I want to do that? I'd rather do movies. I'd do the one-off and then we move on. But anyway, um, I was told a little bit about it, and I was told, you know, Mitch really wanted me to do it, the producer, the writer of the show. Uh, you know, and said, just call him, just call him and have a conversation. And so I was told what this was supposed to be, this role was supposed to be, and basically it was supposed to be a riff on Apollo Creed. Now, really, I don't want to do that. What, what am I going to do with that? That's like, no, thank you, but no, thank you. So call them anyway, because if you've got a better idea or another idea, maybe they'll go along with it. You know, they just really want you on the show. So I called them and we spoke for them briefly, and uh, I listened to them and I said, you know, that's cool, but I have another idea. Now, I have to preface it with saying, I had just gone to lunch, I remember this vividly, because I had just gone to lunch at this wonderful Mexican restaurant I used to go to. And I'd gone there with a buddy of mine. And this buddy was one of those people, we all have these friends, who call you and say, hey, let's go have lunch. And then when you get there, they don't have any money. <laughs> so you kind of like, oh, you know, I forgot my wallet, or oh, I don't have enough cash, or whatever the deal is. We had gone to lunch. The weird thing about it is he called me, then he called me back before we went to lunch and said, but I don't have any money. <laughs> have you heard of an ATM machine? You know, yeah. uh, you know there's some way you can, okay, so I go, I pay for lunch, we go to lunch. Then I get this call, right? So in the afternoon, so when I call back, I say, you know, I've got this idea. How about if I play Carl Weathers, but as the cheapest guy in the world? Because <laughs> I, you know, at a certain point you just say, you know what, if you pull from reality, that's a lot funnier than you can ever make anything up to be. So they listened to the idea, and lo and behold, there I was trying to get in people's bank accounts or trying to get on their check after they had their drinks and were moving on or saving chicken wings to make soup out of or stew out of or whatever the deal is. And it turned into people love it. Uh, Carl Weathers was always looking about, you know, how to get into your pocket and not take anything out of his. <laughs> it worked. It, it certainly did. <laughs> yeah. You can really good I it. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> I don't want to, yeah, can, uh, can we get a mic down here? I don't want to hog Carl. So if you guys have questions, raise your hand. We will bring you a microphone and you can ask him. How you doing, Mr. Carl's? Or Mr. Weathers, sorry. Yeah, I got to tell you, that get up and that voice, they don't work together. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I 
expected a whole other voice. That works, okay. <laughs> Now that I see you, that works. Okay, um, but actually it's a different movie on what it was like to work on The Comebacks, the spoof movie of sports. Oh my god, The Comebacks. Yeah, that was, that was a crazy experience. Uh, David Koechner, who was wonderful, really funny guy, and you've seen him in so many movies. Uh, I'm trying to remember who, who approached me about that. I don't remember who approached me about that movie. But anyway, I think the outtakes were funnier than the movie ultimately wound up being. Because David is like out of his mind funny. And so a lot of stuff he did wasn't PG, but it was funny. There's an version. Oh, then you've seen some of it, okay? Yeah, well, we had we had a great time. I loved working with him. Uh, it was just one of those movies that didn't quite click for whatever reason, you know? But uh, I had a fun night. I had a, a really Fun time with Kevin. This is such an honor to be able to talk to you, Mr. Weathers. This guy, I know this guy so well, so don't buy anything he says. <laughs> don't buy anything he says. And his wife Candace has her head in her hand and they're saying, oh my God. Oh my God. Yes, Brian. Carl, you have to you have to go all the way back to uh, Force Ten Never. And yes. That's one of my that's one of my favorites. Yeah. So you don't, we don't get a chance to hear enough about it, but it, it's such a great cast. And like you and I spoke about earlier, and yeah. we're looking at the cast, it's, it's, it's such a great cast of people. Yeah, maybe a couple stories, or just a couple of things from that, from that set. I think you were over in Yugoslavia, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Thanks, you know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't ask me about that movie, too, because uh, for whatever reason, I just don't know how many people have watched it or... It's not one of those that's on the loop on television that you see like every 15 minutes, you know, so maybe that's why. But the cast alone was pretty amazing because we had Robert Shaw, Harrison Ford, Barbara Bach, Richard Keel, Angus McGinnis, a friend who, who became a friend, uh, uh, Edward, Fo not, yeah, Edward Fox, uh, tremendous amount of wonderful British actors. The movie took five months to shoot in Europe. We were uh, in Yugoslavia for a couple months, shot all over the then Yugoslavia, which tells you how old I am, because Tito was still alive. <laughs> and um, we shot all over Yugoslavia, as I said, from, from the coast inland in the mountains, I and mean, it was crazy. Then we shot on the island of Jersey, then we went to, to London, we shot London, we shot, shot south of England. I shot on Malta, I wasn't there for that. I shot some on Malta. So it was one of those huge British productions with these stars from all over the world. And uh, some of the most memorable stuff about it really was Yugoslavia. It was such a beautiful country, you know. Now it's five or six countries. Uh, and being able to just, you know, in its kind of infancy before it became all these other countries, before this huge, terrible war, you know. It was just magnificently beautiful. And uh, as a young actor, you know, he's getting to know Robert Shaw was, for me, one of the highlights of my career. You know? uh, so being around Robert and his family and, and all the other actors, you get to hang out for five months, you get a chance to, you gotta be around people, you know? It's not like you're just there for three days or four days or a month. You know? uh, but it's just one of those movies that, in, in the movies that I've done, I have, I have great fondness for it, for even though it wasn't a huge, you know, by some of the standards, success, uh, either critical or you know, uh, commercial success. Uh, but a lot of fun. And one of those things that was just kind of one of the building blocks, you know, as an actor, as a young actor in particular, on just what you do on a set. And, and having stamina, because five months on a set is a long time. You get tired after a while, because, it takes a long time to set things up, to write them, to rehearse them. You're not working every day. So there's a lot of stuff sitting around, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh, but it's a good lesson on what it takes you know, to be a professional film actor. So, I hope that's it. I hope that gave you something. Cool. Uh, hi. I hi, Ask Ben. <laughs> I thought you were amazing in all of the Rocky movies. Thank you. And anyway though, my question was, how was it like working with Sylvester Stallone and Mr. T? 
Both were fantastic. Uh, Sly is a pro. Mr. T was probably he'd done some stuff, I think, but pretty, pretty, I guess, young as an actor, uh, but really did a great job. I think, uh, I think most people with Clover Lane learn to hate him real fast, you know. And for an actor to be courageous enough to jump in that when you know he's laughing at himself sometimes, trying to be so tough. Uh, and he was fantastic in it. And Sly, of course, I mean, you know, talk about a career and uh, an amazingly creative guy and probably one of the most resilient actors I've ever been around. Uh, you know, again, it's funny, you can learn so much from watching other people and just watching him and, and how he's gone about, you know, building a career and creating so much of the projects that he's been in. And if not creating them, really sort of guiding them through has been fantastic. So it was a, it was again just a fantastic time, to, and to be a part of that whole, you know, those iconic movies. How many actors can say, you know, some of the movies I've been involved in? Oh my God, you know, sometimes if you just have one, but when you have multiples of them that people really enjoy, you know, and that that not only have great financial success, but also that fans just really love. I mean. And the critics really, you know, have a lot of good things to say, but sometimes not so good, but mostly good things to say. It's all been fantastic with the Rocky series. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes? Oh. Hi. Hi. I had a couple of Rocky questions as well. Yes. The first is, um, how did you feel when you found out that your character would be killed off in the fourth movie? Did you see it as like a dramatic role, or I'm not going to get paid for the next one? I kind of like the latter, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, man, I mean, uh, when you know the party's over, it's kind of hard, you know what I mean? Right. Uh, the truth is, I, I, didn't, I didn't really think about it that much. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, there is a point, I think, most of the artists that I know, and I'd like to consider myself an artist, I think I've grown into that. Uh, want to do things that challenge them, that stretch them, that reveal other sides of their talent. And as much as I kind of have a love for Apollo Creed, if you're going to go out, go out big. Yeah. <laughs> Apollo Creed went out big. Yeah. Yeah. And on top of it, I think uh, the way it was all orchestrated, um, I don't know if you can get more memorable. You know, if you go if you go from with an arc and any character as, 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 an, as an actor, as an artist, and you begin in one place, and then you wind up in a completely different place, and the audience has gone along with you for that ride, and they go along with you emotionally in that ride, and at the end of that whole thing, you got people who, in the beginning, were basically cheering for you to get your heart ripped out of your chest. And at the end, they're crying because you're gone, and your families. That's pretty significant. You've made some sort of mark. You know? And so my consciousness around the whole thing was, basically, how do I finish this thing off in a way that's really you know, important, for lack of a better word, movies? important, at least in my career, if not to audiences, but also that, you know, that really nails the coffin shut, so to speak, you know, yeah. that metaphor. You know, uh, that, what else are you going to do with it? Once you've seen Apollo Creed, man, there ain't no one else, you know? And so I'm really, really pleased with where it was, regardless of the fact that, hmm, there was a whole lot of coming left <laughs> But it was all cool. It's all cool. Now your other question. So yes, my second question was, was there any difference in how Sylvester Stallone approached directing the next two movies after the first two was someone else? Guys got a big brain here. That's a really good question, huh? Uh, who wrote that question for you? Because that's a good question. Oh, thank you very much. That's a really good question. Uh, I have maintained just one voice that I've maintained from the very beginning. Sly is a really good director. And I don't know that people uh, 
either give him credit for how good he is as a director because they haven't worked with him as a director, or because his other talents in front of the camera as a writer are so significant that they don't understand what it takes to actually then get there and direct a movie and put it all together right to the very end when it's released. Because you may shoot a ton of stuff, but you've also then got to have an editor edit it. You've got to put sound to it. You've got to color correct it. There are many things that will never reach the light of day because they just don't work. They're not significant. The movie changes in editing from what you wrote originally. And as a director, that's your job to sort of, you know, manipulate that, shape all that. And then you got to deal with studio who's saying this, that, the other. It's got to be ready for this date, this running time. It goes on and on and on. Uh, He's a phenomenal director. Uh, John Albertson, bless him, was for me one of the best I ever worked with, right alongside like John McTiernan. Uh, but Sly is really a significant talent when it comes to directing. So for me, it was a blast. Because uh, nothing, there's nothing like a guy who's an actor who's had to stand in front of the camera and then tell you what to do when you're standing in front of the camera. Because it's a whole other discipline. There's a different voice there. They understand the language of acting, et cetera, et cetera. So I really appreciate him, not only as a, as a writer and as an actor, but really as a director. And I've told him that. You know, <coughs> I think he's a phenomenal director. Thank you. Yeah. So, all right. What was it like to, what kind of guy was Arnold like? And what was it like just to be on the set of Predator? Every time somebody asks me the question, what was somebody like? <laughs> I had a lot of fun on the set. Arnold was like Arnold. He's the same guy you see. I have no stories that are titillating, good, different. You've seen him, right? What is he like? You tell me what's he like. <laughs> He's strong, and he'll be back. And what? He'll be back. There you go. You said it all. You know, it's kind of like when you, what they say about attorneys, never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. So why'd you ask me that question if you were angry the answer? It was a lot of fun. We had a great time. By the way, everybody on that, on that set, all those actors, the director, the producers, one of the best experiences I've ever had making movies. It was wild, crazy, bunch of guys running around in the jungle, all sweaty, with no makeup on except for camel paint. And you didn't have to worry about scratching your butt. There, were no, there was one woman on the set, so you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. You didn't have to worry about how badly you smelled at the end of the day from sweating all day long. Uh, it was just a great time, you know, it was like, but literally like being in the gym, you know? Uh, we had a good time, and, and they're the kind of memories in, in a movie like that that you can't replicate, because the only special effect was the Predator, you know? A bunch of stunt men getting blown to hell, and a lot of firepower, and all that stuff. There was no CGI with all that stuff, you know? We were doing the stuff, and so, you know, two and a half months of that, that's a good time. That's a good time. And I think all the guys can attest to it. Everybody from, from Shane Black, who's directing The New Predator, who was a fantastic writer, who wrote Lethal Weapon and got in The Last Boy Scout, so many other great movies, uh, to uh, Bill Duke, to Arnold, to uh, Jesse. Jesse the Body, Ventura. Uh, I mean, yeah, a couple of others. I know, I know. I know. Uh, it was a great time. And John McTiernan is a phenomenal director, knows lenses as well as anybody I've ever worked with. And that, you know, you get a group like that together, and a great producer in Joel Silver. I mean, you know, he's, if you don't know his name, I mean, you know, everything from The Matrix to Action Jackson to uh, Predator to, oh my God, so many movies. Joel is directed, I mean, to, to, uh, was the thing that Bruce did, that uh, crazy thing with the, the skyscraper and the guys? Die Hard. Die Hard, yeah. I mean, I mean come on, man. You know, if you're a producer and you produce stuff like that, I don't care how crazy you are, you're crazy like a fox. That's pretty good, you know? So, uh, 
that was a good movie. It was a lot of fun. Predator was. How do you feel about uh, Michael B. Jordan as your son in the Creed movies? Like, how do you feel about his performance, and what do you think of those movies? I have no feelings at all about it. Now, if you want to know what I think, that's all good. Uh, I'm happy for him. I think he does a great job. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah. that that they did a nice job on putting the movie together that you know pays homage to Apollo Creed and that whole Rocky legacy. Uh, I don't know that anybody else could have done it, to be honest with you. I think the writer-directors did a great job. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, having nothing to do with it other than letting them use some footage from the other Rockies, my say so, but what I, you know, what I think doesn't really matter. It's what audience is thinking. People went to them, went to them enough to send the studio and said, let's do it again. So I guess they, they hit one out of the park, you know? And I just say, man, when you're making movies, bless them all, because everybody doesn't have that kind of success, you know? So they did a great job. Yes, no, no more? One more. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, so you mentioned Robert Shaw. Yes. So I heard, like, on the set of Jaws that he would pick on uh, Richard Dreyfuss a lot and make why him do push-ups. Why not so. pick on Richard? I, I love him. I love him. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I was wondering if he did anything like that on uh, was it Force 10 from Navarone or, you know, if he picked on you or anything or pushed you or had a rivalry. He knew better than to push me. <laughs> No, uh, he was, uh, you know what, he was unbelievably sweet to me. Uh, by the way, you know, every time I read those things, I can't believe that stuff that you read. Okay, that's, that's good. Well, I think it was playfully. Huh, playfully? Yeah. Maybe, maybe. It, it came but, across. But by the way, uh, you're, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about guys who have great senses of humor, you know, and Dreyfus, is not what you'd call a wallflower. I mean, he is, you know. I had, I had a brief, brief moment of, of Rick Dreyfus when, I don't know if many of you know this, but uh, of course you would, Brian. Brian knows everything I've ever done. Brian knows what time, knows what time I was born in the morning, how much I weighed. No, you don't. Uh, no, I, uh, I, I was in, very briefly in the original uh, Close Encounters of the Third Time. And I had a scene, the one scene in the movie with Rick Dreyfus. So, you know, first of all, I'm a huge fan of his, always have been, and then of Steven Spielberg. So to be in a scene with Rick Dreyfus and directed by Steven Spielberg, when I was still trying to figure out what I was doing, man, that's pretty cool. So both Rick and Robert Shaw and all those you know, people, talented people like that, for me, I just have nothing but good stuff to say about it. Uh, and so if there was any teasing, I could see it was all probably you know, goodwill kind of teasing. Yeah. But one of my favorite movies, man, Jaws, oh my God. What a great, great movie. Some of the shots and, and what, you know, what Steven did in that, I mean, just think about it. You look at that movie, you really study that movie. Oh my God, that's a great movie. I mean, it's, it's great, it's not just good. Because you, you know, if you think about it, the very beginning of that movie, where that movie opens, the kid's on the beach, and running around, and these little flirtatious things going on. And then the girl sort of teasing him, and running out, and going down the beach, and he's following, and he's kind of all, they've been drinking, so, you know, teenager's kind of like ready to fall over, and he literally does at one point. She's out in the water and you see this beautiful figure and she's ripped off her bathing suit and she's in there and she's being flirtatious and calling him. And you just see the, from, from the ocean, shooting up, right? <coughs> it becomes scary as hell as soon as you hear that music. <laughs> and then you see her with the shot above and you see her somehow get grabbed by something and pulled under and she comes back up. That music goes and then she's being flopped around. Oh man, that's that's a good. That's a good movie, man. Thank, thank you. Yeah, that's good. I went off onto that one. I love I love movies. That's a good movie. That's a good movie. Yeah.
You know, there's just one other thing I want to say about that, because I love that movie so much. I do. One of the, like, because I, I'm directing as well, but you know, you study really good directors. The shot on the ferry, when they're going across on the ferry, you've got Scheider and who else is on that? The mayor. The mayor is on the ferry, who I don't remember the actors in. Really good, yeah. And then you've got the politicians and all that thing. And it's all done in one shot. And the, the ferry flips around, and Stephen has them walking from the background into the foreground, and it looks like there's an awful lot of movement, but it's just choreography of the actors, and it's just the one camera. That is brilliant, man. Whenever you can get, for any director, myself included, if you can get a one that just look literally one, they call it a one 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 take with one camera, and you get all these different shots in one, it's like, holy moly, man, this cat's on fire. So you go from all this sort of crazy action stuff with the, the shark that doesn't work, that they had to sort of figure out how to get it to work, and the great talent they had, and, the, and that forced perspective zoom on the, on the beach when Shiner's there and you know, the camera comes in the background changes, when they think they see the shark. Oh, I could talk about that movie for <laughs> Great stuff. Great stuff. Anyway, sorry about that. Went off, I went off. Well, it's hard to me to uh, follow that up, but if you want, I can just ask Brian a question. There you go. There you go. Hey, uh, I know you said... Way to go, Brian. <laughs> I know you said that you didn't box much before you got into Rocky, and Rocky Three is my all-time favorite movie of all time. I just loved it. And you, yourself, and all the Rockies were just amazing. Thank you. Yeah, but anyway, uh, my question is, there at the end, and you um, said let's go for a couple rounds and, and uh, did you guys ever in practice or anything get to play around or you and Sylvester or did you, uh, was it all just in movies and if so, did you ever get clocked good enough to where you know you got clocked? Yes to both those questions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you know guys. <laughs> you want to test each other sometimes. And uh, no malice in it, but uh, you really think you you got something going on? Okay, yeah. And then there were times when the guy just makes a mistake. You're supposed to move that way, but instead they move this way. Or he's supposed to do this, and he doesn't do it. And, you know. So after you get hit the second time, then it's, ah, ah, don't do that again. Because, <laughs> yeah, they, you know, I mean, come on, man. You know, you pull punches, but... If you get hit, <laughs> you feel it. Because you're, you know, a lot of the times we were going for the head. So, I mean, hell, you know, it's like things get rattled a little bit, you know? Uh, but then the times where it was designed, most of those were body shots, you know, and you can take it there. You can cover yourself in a way. Uh, but the training for it all, I think, got us both in the kind of shape where you could do it and sustain it, you know? Uh, but those, those fights, man, those fights were, I mean, the time it took, you know, the very first movie as an example, that, I think we shot the fight, I think it was seven days, maybe eight days, but it was like all day. I mean, it's 10, 12 hour days in the rain, you know, and so each of us had to have a masseur because you just tighten up, you go, you know, every time you stop, You've got all sweaty and everything, plus they're throwing water on you too to make you look like you're really sweaty and now you're moving around the ring and you've got three cameras and you're trying to get the punches to look like they're right and they're landing when they're you know, not really doing that. And all day long, it is draining. Thank God we were in our 20s. <laughs> you can do that when you're in your 20s and get away with it. As we get older, you can't do that. The body doesn't cooperate, you know. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm really, really grateful for the fact that not only did we pull something off that I think no one else has been able to pull off. And, I mean, you watch the movies and it just doesn't look the same. And it's partly because, you know, both of us were very athletic and both of us really just kind of had a, uh, a kind of thing, you know, that we could work together really well. Uh, that doesn't happen all the time. You know, no stuntmen were used in any of those boxes you know, any of those matches. So that right there, you know, how many movies can you pull that off? Of? There's a lot of hours in the ring, man. Uh, 
and we always had to shoot the fights first, just in case somebody got hurt. Because at the end of the movie, I mean, we're dieting and all that, and you're really trying to get ripped. So if you had to shoot a whole movie and you're just eating like regular people and you're not training and all that, you couldn't sustain it, you know? So we train two and a half months or so before the movie, do the right dieting and stay in the gym, stay in the gym, stay in the gym, and then go shoot the fight. And then we go and shoot the rest of the movie. So, you know, if anybody out here is directing or doing that, that's the secret. Do all the really physical, tough stuff first. And if anybody just drops off and if they're going, as, as uh, who was it, uh, I can't remember which character said, if he dies, he dies. Oh, that was Drago. Drago, if he dies, he, hey, if they die, they die. <laughs> Let's get another guy to step in at that. You know? That's just the way it is. That's life, okay? <laughs> of course I'm Jess, of course. But last one, guys. Uh, they're giving me the signal back there, so. So kind of a two-part question. <laughs> I give it a three point or four point, and it's okay, no matter how long. <laughs> so I heard you had auditioned for Star Trek Deep Space Nine. I heard that too, but I don't remember that. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, what's next for Carl Weathers? And any chance we would see you in a Star Trek episode or series or something of some sort? There's always a chance of almost anything until you're dead. I'm still alive at this point, so maybe that could happen, but nobody's approached me about it. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that's next. Uh, I did a couple of episodics recently, uh, just a one-off, in the new Magnum P.I. And I went and reprised uh, the character I did on Chicago Justice, uh, on SUV, Law and Order SUV. And then I got a new project that, uh, that I'm you know, supposed to be shooting pretty soon. Not only did that because there's a lot to do, so it's gonna be interesting. And I'm about to go off and direct something if all goes well and the hurricane doesn't mow down all the islands of Hawaii, you know? So that's, uh, that's it. That's it. That'll, that'll take me through the end of the year. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.